Welcome to Bits and Bobs. The show where we bring you tabletop gaming news and entertainment from around the globe. So grab a nice coffee and sit back. And let us welcome you to our table. Hey everyone. So welcome to another Bits and Bobs special edition for Shelf of Palooza. I'm, I'm excited. I hope everybody's having a fantastic time because I know I probably already am. So today, since the show usually revolves around tabletop, I want to kind of bring you to the other area of the tabletop that I really enjoy, and that's role-playing games. I actually met my partner at a role-playing game. It was my very first one, and he happened to be the DM. When a lot of us think of role-playing games, though, the first thing that comes to mind is D&D. And I like D&D. It's, it's fine. But there's a ton of other options out there. Say you don't like fantasy. There are other options in so far as the world that you could find yourself set in. We are going to be tackling one this weekend entitled Brindlewood Bay, where we actually play little old ladies in a mystery book club who find that something is amiss in our small town. So if you can imagine like Jessica Fletcher and uh, Agatha Christie's Miss Marple all together solving mysteries. Um, it's going to be fantastic. There's Mouse Guard, if you enjoyed the Redwall series of stories, in which you get to play a teeny tiny little mouse living in a mouse society and doing things like going out in spring to make sure the paths are clean or taking care of bees, which are kind of the same size as you. If you have a type of intellectual property that is in geekdom, all of geekdom, it has probably been made into a role-playing game. There's everything from Star Wars to Star Trek, from Edgar Rice Burroughs type Hollow Earth. There are Westerns built on all the spaghetti Westerns that you may have enjoyed as a kid. And there's even things built on cartoons like She-Ra or Steven Universe. So if you already have an interest and maybe you wanna dive in by being Conan the Barbarian or a Jedi, take a look. There is probably something in that property that you can totally explore via the role-playing tabletop. There's also, different systems based on what you might like. Maybe you like things that are really crunchy and rules driven, but then there's other ones that are just about telling stories with your friends. One of my favorites happens to be Fiasco, which plays a little like a Coen Brothers movie in which you start trying to do a heist and by about halfway through, everything goes completely pear-shaped and you've got to try and muddle your way out and, and hopefully make it out of that situation. It's a fantastic opportunity to get together with friends and just tell a really, really wacky story without a ton of mechanics or books to flip through or anything like that. I, you know, if you've never tried playing things at the tabletop of that nature, I welcome you to. You can even start with something as simple as a storytelling uh, card game. Something like someone has died. Start you off with little cards that give you prompts through which you and everyone that you're playing with get to tell a story. And they're a fantastic way to kind of build an adventure with a group of friends. Another nice thing about them is they don't always require the tabletop. So everybody can kind of sit in the comfy chair that they want to in their space and tell the story together. Consider diving into some sites like Drive Through RPG or RPG Geek, adjacent to Board Game Geek, and find out what's available because there really is a ton of stuff out there if you really want to get your storyteller on. Hi, it's Stella from Maple University and the Dice Teller. Today I'm going to share you my favorite escape room in the box. We do also love those escape room, the physical games where you run around and then trying to find and solve clues, but these days I've been playing a lot of the escape room in the box because of the lockdown and it's a perfect date night game with Heron. We work together, we're not going to, you know, fight each other. So I'm going to show you my four series of my favorite one. First one is Unlock. So with Unlock you don't destroy any of the components, usually the one that we've played anyway. And this one comes in a card and you need to have the app and you play and solve it and the puzzles are really smart, not too, you know, not too weird, just good. So it comes with different difficulties. Second one is exit the game, you probably know this one. Unfortunately, this one you have to destroy components, but it's okay. It's still worth it. It's, it's a really good game. The puzzles are really, really smart. Usually it's got a box and then a book and you might need to destroy the book somehow. Um, we really like this and uh, Marcus and Inca brands really done well. The other one is Adventure Games, Phil Walker-Harding and Matthew Dunstan. 
this is slightly different again. Um, it, this is more uh, narrative based and you can choose different characters to play along and it will give you different results. So that's really awesome. And last but not least, okay, tell me if you think I have a problem. Ta da! Okay, this is Escape Room, the game. Very unique name, no? So that one comes with the decoder on the base game, but you can still use the app if you want, where you try to put four keys to move on to the next step. So he are uh, some keys, you put it there and then you press it down. If you got it right, it'll give you ding rather than ba boom, which means wrong. So let me see if I can put it on. Ah, there you go. And that's wrong. Okay, so it has that and it is compatible with the rest of the games this is why I'm, i got so excited and i got these much expansions there are more than i have but this is probably one of our favorites um maybe if it's not exit unlock hmm okay i can't just between those four so those four are my favorite um and why should you believe me because i'm batman so thanks for watching. Share me what your favorite escape room games are um, in the comment section. So I'll have a look and maybe I'll add that to my favorite collections. Thank you. Bye. And share and whatever. Uh, find, find four keys to try to solve the problem. Hi, I am Carla Cobb. Um, I'm a game designer, developer and publisher and I run Weird Draft Games. Um, today I want to talk about different ways to start designing. Um, when most people talk about game design, they usually talk about starting either theme first, mechanics first, or a combination of the two. Um, but I wanted to introduce maybe a couple different ways where you could start thinking about game design. Um, the first would be palette first design, component first design, um, and then a combination of both of these. Um, so palette first, um, well, first off, a palette is like a different color palette. So like it could have like a deep blue and a light yellow and maybe a red. And that might make you think of maybe a sunrise at the beach or something like that. Um, but yeah, like a palette would just be um, some colors that are put together um, that kind of make up the aesthetics of the game. Um, so just go online, find like a random palette generator and choose the first one that really inspires you. Um, when you look at it, do you think of a certain area or a time period or like a holiday? Like um, maybe like Mardi Gras has a really distinctive color palette um, or the beach or, you know, anything that you can think of. Um, the next one is components first. Um, with components first design, you kind of say what kind of components you want to use before you have any idea on what the theme or um, mechanics will be. And you just have to make something out of the components that you put together. Um, now for joining the two um, and making it more restrictive. Um, for instance, um, I have these cubes left over, like I got a bunch of random cubes um, and these were the ones I didn't use. Um, so like there's a light pink and a light green, like all these pastel -y colors. And when I looked at these cubes, um, it reminded me of ice cream, like uh, uh, pistachio ice cream, strawberry ice cream. And I also had like these cubes are slightly chunky. Um, so it made me think of maybe uh, like a game where you were building up an ice cream cone and maybe there's a dexterity element, like trying to like pressure look and see how how high you can build up this little uh, ice cream cube tower. Um, but without like having these cubes and just thinking about it like, hey, this could be in a game in itself, like maybe add some cards to it and that's what you got. Um, I would have never thought of having like an ice cream stacking game, um, which is really why um, having these different game design uh, methods are, is really cool um, because it will 
it can take you down a different path than you normally would go up down and you can start like branching out like if you ever get um, tired of doing the same thing over and over again just try this as an exercise and you might be able to be a better game designer if you can just um, take some components in a palette and build an entire game about it. Um, so what I recommend is like limit yourself in one of these ways um, and then start thinking about like what theme or mechanics can be derived by the constraints you've put down. Um, is there anything about the components that will lead you in a certain direction? Um, so yeah, um, constraints can be super inspiring and you can design something that's completely out of your wheelhouse this way and that's how we all become better. Hi everyone, my name is Benita and not to be dramatic, but board games changed my life. Let's rewind to February 2017 and my best friend invites me to a board game cafe for her birthday brunch. I grew up playing mass market board games like Clue, Scrabble, so I had that background and I kind of knew other board games existed because my friend's boyfriend had taken her to board game conventions, but I had no idea what modern board games like even meant. So we're at this brunch and we play a small world and I was stunned. I had never played any type of game like this. I was in love. Two months later, I have not stopped talking about Small World that my brother buys it for me for my birthday. That same day, I want to go to a restaurant that doesn't take online reservations, so we went a little early and put our name down. Nearby, I found that there was a board game bar, and because it's my birthday, we went. And I didn't really recognize any of the games, but I happened to pick up Carcassonne because the rule book wasn't very long. So we start playing it and I'm just like, this isn't like anything I've played before. I'm placing down tiles, we're building our own cities. Later I come to find out that I just love tile placement games, but it's just so much fun. So literally that same night I take out my phone and I buy Carcassonne. Mind you, a few glasses of wine probably factored into this decision, but I love the game, so no regrets. Then a few days later, I'm watching Supergirl and they're having a game night and I have absolutely no idea what this game is. So I Google it, Supergirl board game. I turn up with nothing. So I end up taking a picture of the TV and sending it to my friend and asking them, what game is it? I find out it's Catan. So Small World, Carcassonne, Catan are really just my introduction to modern board games. And it kind of snowballed from there. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you how many board games I now have. But like I said, board games changed my life. Through board games, I've made incredible lifelong friends. I discovered a hobby that takes me away from the screen. And most importantly, I'm a part of Girls' Game Shelf where I work alongside women who kick ass and are amazing. So yeah, board games changed my life. Hey there, friends. I'm Rachel. Hey, I'm Julie. Uh, we're starting a new segment, and it's called You're Invited. This show is going to focus on the lessons that we've learned from being publishers in the board game industry. Next week, we're going to focus on tips for busy entrepreneurs. So, Rachel, do you want to give a sneak peek? Oh, yes. So, I found this really cool thing called Google Streak. And it integrates in with G Suite for a single email address. It's free. And it basically keeps track of all your emails and who hasn't responded, who has responded, and keeps you uh, on track. And you can even get further into it where you can go with funnels and even go down that rabbit hole. Uh, we're also going to talk about block scheduling. And as entrepreneurs, we are all really good at those resource management games, right? Because that's what we're doing every day with our microcosm of limited time and money. That That's all the problem solving we do every day. Well, that pretty much covers everything. I think we're good. No. Um. <laughs> right? Right? No. Uh, what can I add? I So for our company, I will say that... What we do is we use a pro system called Atlassian's Jira task. So what we're, what we're going to talk about on my end is creating epics for each of your projects, meaning that you're looking top down from a project, usually a board game, but sometimes it's a marketing strategy. 
So the big picture and then how you break it up into smaller increments for yourself and also to assign to your team. And for us, we love it. It's a little bit of a, hmm, it isn't a little bit, it's a lot for <laughs> a small company. But what we do like about it is you can also take it and use it to make your incoming emails ticketed uh, so that it gives you an automatic response for your customers versus a response for to your um, contractors and lets you keep track of things that way so that it's a much more automated system, especially when you're smaller and you're trying to look like, you know, you're big time. I mean, anybody who can automate all that stuff for me, I'm going to listen to you all day long, Julie. <laughs> So sure, if you not? guys want to hear more in-depth information, follow us on Facebook. You're invited. Tune in on Friday mornings at 930 Central and 1030 Eastern. And if you are wondering, you're invited. Hello, I am Banana Chan and I am the owner and co-founder of a small box board game publishing company called Game in a Curry, but I also write a lot of role playing games and I also write for other companies and do a whole lot of development work for RPGs. So today I'm going to be talking about how you can get started with writing your own RPG. Now I'm going to preface here by saying that some of the stuff is stuff that I've done, so maybe it's not gonna work for you, but it works for me, so this is my process. And if you're working on a game that has themes that are outside of your own culture, ideally you should be talking to a consultant or inviting more people on to collaborate with you. So let's get started with some of the things that I do. Step number one, brainstorm. So when you brainstorm stuff, that's when you have all of your thoughts jumbled up in your head and you want to throw it down somewhere. So what I usually do is I would toss all of my ideas and just vomit them out onto a Google Doc. And from this Google Doc, I would just like pare things out, edit things down, take things, you know, that I don't like or don't work or, you know, don't make a lot of sense and just like strip them down and like focus on the things that I want to work on. Step two, pull up your template. So a template usually is an outline of all the things that you're going to put in your game. So this is gonna be stuff like the title, the safety stuff, the mechanics, the setting, the theme, like all the stuff that you need to have in this game is just gonna be outlined for you in this template so that, that way you have an idea of what to tackle. Step three, make a plan for what you're going to work on. So for me, usually I like to work in a four week schedule. So that way I can sort of hit the goals and have a first draft uh, as quickly as possible. So the first week I'm probably gonna work on the setting or the themes. And then the second thing I would work on is the mechanics. So like the second week, maybe I would start, you know, planning out the mechanics, writing out like all the stuff that I think would fit. And then at the end of the four week period, I would have a first draft. Step five, development. So now you have your draft, you have your first draft and it's, you know, probably not the best, but that's okay because this is just the first draft. It's not going to be perfect. And, you know, with your first draft, you're going to iterate on it. You're going to remove stuff. You're going to change things. This is the time where you start doing solo development. So you're going to be reading through the entire thing, looking at pain points, trying to find things that maybe you didn't spot before. And with solo play testing, you want to sort of make sure that you know what's going on when one thing happens and how does that trigger like another event. So sort of planning out like, you know, what is going to happen when these uh, when these prompts come up. Step six you're going to be showing it to other people. So when you're showing it to other people, you might want to play test just like specific mechanics in the game and not the entire thing if you don't have a lot of time. But if you do have a lot of time, I highly suggest going through the entire thing in a one shot scenario that maybe you've like written up. I also suggest using like a quick start so that way, you know, players get a sense of what all the different mechanics are, what the themes are, what, you know, the different types of elements that they're going to encounter in this game are. Another thing to look out for is to see if the theme 
works with the mechanics. So if you have this mechanic and it, you know is fun and whatever, but it just doesn't really fit with what you're working on, it's good to have another set of eyes to tell you like, hey, maybe this isn't the right theme. No one ever said that development is easy. Another thing with playtesting is sort of think of it as user testing. Like don't think of this thing as your baby, your precious. Instead, just treat it as like, you know, a product. So that way you can remove yourself from the thing that you're making, even though you're probably really passionate about it. And, you know, if someone did say something bad about it, it would break your heart. At least this is something that I've learned from art school. Step seven, iterate, develop, do all the things. So, you know, one play test is probably not going to be enough if you're making like a big box game or if you're making like a like a big long book. Ideally, you kind of want to get other game developers to look at your game because the worst kind of feedback they can ever get is, oh, that was nice. I had a fun time unless they genuinely mean it because, you know, sometimes they actually do. So try to read the room when you're playtesting. And those are the seven steps that I usually go through when I'm making a role-playing game. And they take quite some time and it is a lot of work, but at the end of the day, you have something that you're proud of and you have something that you're happy with that you're excited to share with the world. Hi, I'm Monique. Bye. This is, uh, this is Atticus and this is Valkyrie. Valkyrie uh, wrote out some of the, her, the five games at no particular like favorite or ranking system or whatever, just five games that we like to play together as a family and I'll talk about five games I also like to play with her. Leave your sister alone. Five Minute Dungeon. Five Minute Dungeon is um, real fast. Faster it's, now. It's a lot of fun. I said fast. Third. Yes, you did. We go really fast. What do you like about it? Um, uh, what I like about Five Minute Dungeon is that it's really, it's just a really funny game. Like, whenever you fight, like, the bosses, they have, like, the funny titles. Like, oh my god, it's a dragon or something. And, yeah. <laughs> and it also has this app where it has different voices. Uh, another game that we both really like uh, that's pretty like fast and energizing and, and kind of like a race to the finish is Mangaka. Mangaka. Yeah. That one you're rushing against the timer to complete a comic um, and you have different parameters to meet for your fans, for your own happiness, a lot of chaos toward the end because you have more and more to draw and less and less time to do it as time goes on. So what's next? Donuts for Donuts. It's more fun with more people than just two. Mm -hmm. There's different donuts and you're, you're, you're collecting them to eat them and they're each worth different points. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think another game that I just like really like playing with you is Quacks of Quedlinburg. Mm -hmm. It's just that game I brought home like towards the beginning of quarantine. So, uh, and like we just had so much fun playing it. And it was just like a brand new kind of game for Valkyrie. And, um... Technically, you're making, like, potions of stuff. Yeah. So that one is uh, another really fun one. I'm surprised how much I enjoyed it and just immediately kind of got hooked. Um, I think another game I really like to play with Valkyrie is uh, Sunday Split. And that one, you're building a Sunday. You, you want to avoid getting, like, corn or asparagus or vegetables like broccoli in your Sunday. And you just want to make sure, like, it's like, I pick, I split, you choose kind of game. And this one is quite mischievous. And uh, she usually has mm -hmm. quite a few tricks up her sleeve that really come out when we're playing Sunday Split. Also, Quirky Circus. It's so weird. Look at my Yeah. No. Uh, I'm the wild card something. in that game. Yes, she is. Valkyrie, you never know what's coming when you're playing Quirky Circuits with Valkyrie, for sure. <laughs> one game I love watching Valkyrie play is Azul. Um, that one also gets like gets her little mischievous going because she'll like, kind of just take what she knows I need or, or what someone else needs. Mm -hmm. But it's also just fun to watch her think about and plan out her whole strategy about how she's going to try and complete her her tiles and put them all together. Clink! You're trying to avoid this yet deadly dragon, so you're just like get, grabbing treasure of some sort, and there's like a market 
somehow it survives through the dragon's <laughs> yeah. blasts of fire. Leaving I her, kick butt. <laughs> yeah, no, she, she, we straight up left her dad to die. So uh, we got to play with her co-parent, and it was great fun. And then uh, after that, she really loved it, so I got I don't like a dark. You don't like the dark. Uh, after that, we got Acquisitions Incorporated, to which she's very excited to paint those minis. Mole Rat in Space. We got that as a gift from Brent Dickman and uh, Mike from uh, Elf Creek Games. When Valkyrie was sick, they sent us like a whole box of games that we all really loved playing together. But Mole Rats in Space ended up being a favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like uh, Pandemic for Kids. Uh, it's it another is. Matt Lecoq game. Your <laughs> Mole Rats trying to escape snakes and that have taken over your ship. So you want to gather supplies, jump into the escape pod, and yeet back out into space before the snakes can get you and not leave any supplies behind. No so this is about it. Allowed. All right, you guys want to say goodbye? Bye. 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 Good luck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dee Dee from A Girl, A Game, and A Goal. And I've been graciously invited here by Anna Maria from Girls Game Shelf to provide a segment for Bits and Bobs. So I'm going to show you hopefully something that may inspire you to get crafty with your bits and bobs of board games because I myself am a gamer, but I'm also an avid crafter. So let's okay. take a look. So does this look like your table after you get a game? And of course, the first thing we have to do is pop out all the pieces, unwrap it, and we're left with all this cardboard, maybe some extra bags, packing material, extra stuff. Well, what do we normally do with this? We throw it in the trash. Well, I'm gonna show you a great idea what you can do with this stuff right okay. here. Okay, so, got my glasses on, and I'm gonna introduce a few more elements to this menagerie of things such as and not limited to so be as creative as you want um board game sheets you know i took a cartographer's i had a whole bunch of patchwork doodle ones i also had some print and play ones that i had done online with people on different streams like loser palooza and girls game shelf and um um, this these one. are just printouts and then I say you know what I can grab a few more elements so I printed up some meeples and I printed up some some dice and just cut them into any kind of shapes so I just made this desk even okay. more so what not all to create with that mess and all the extra little bits and bobs well we can create something that's called the scrapbook page and I'm going to show you an example of the scrapbook page that I created from the stuff that you just saw I've layered stuff, I've added a photo that I printed, I've added a title up here, game night, I've added a subtitle down here, these are the times, smile, and it's just different components, things that come from our hobby. And I've made it 8x10 because most people can get their hands on an 8x10 frame, they're familiar with that size, and so this is one thing that you can pop into a frame, it really dresses it up, and it's unique and special to you and your family, and your game room, and you're just gonna have a ball making it. Don't be afraid, just have at it. Just lay your stuff, pick the colors, print some stuff, have fun with your crafts, merge another hobby into that board gaming love that you have. And just to show you how dressy it can look, I have another example for you. So, the reason we're here, right? One of the reasons we're here, which is, Anna Maria has invited us all, but also we have Luza Palooza. And so I created, and I'm showing you this now, and hopefully I don't get too much glare. Here is the Luza Palooza scrapbook page. Here we go, there we go. This is the scrapbook page that I created for Luza Palooza as an alternative example at a full 12 by 12 size that I put into a frame. So look how fabulous this is. I mean, you can hang this on the wall. And it is a speaking point, I mean, really. So go out there, print some photos, grab some bits and bobs, and create yourself some art. So thank you so much. And if you wanna know more crafty things, you can visit my channel, which is A Girl, A Game, and A Goal, both on YouTube and Twitch. Thank you, and bye, till next time. Hello, my name is Fertessa Elise, and I wanted to start a segment on board game etiquette. I think that board game etiquette is something that's not widely discussed. 
Um, often we talk about how to play board games or what board games we recommend, but we don't really discuss um, what it means to play with another person and um, different ways to kind of um, be mindful of the people that you game with. So I think what I want to accomplish by going over this is to make gaming enjoyable, um, not only for yourself, but for the people that you play with. For today, uh, what I want to go over is respecting time when it comes to gaming. Um, what I mean by respecting time is being mindful that time to you is not the same to the person that you are playing with. Um, for example, I've noticed that um, in some of my gaming groups, it is perfectly acceptable for... Um, other players to refill areas of the board while I am taking my turn. For example, if I was playing Splendor and I decided to take a card um, and um, I'm like getting my stuff in order, somebody else is already refilling um, the card row that I took from. But same situation, if I'm playing with uh, my boyfriend or um, a casual player who, you know, isn't used to that, then me automatically refilling um, that space while they're taking their turn feels like me rushing them. Um, and that's something that never occurred to me. I was like, well, I'm, I'm just being polite. I'm helping you out. But to them, it could seem like I'm impatient and I can't wait for their turn to be over and I also think that maybe they aren't capable of refilling the board themselves. So I'm just jumping ahead of the line um, to kind of finish their sentence before they, you know, can complete the thought. Um, but in my gaming groups, that's totally normal. But you have to read the room for something like that. Um, same thing um, with feedback. Uh, whenever... I'm playtesting a game, I like to pay attention to the people that I'm playing with because there are people who love to immediately jump in and say what they have to say about, oh, I like this part of the game or I wish this part of the game was different. But there are also other players who, you know, will not say anything until directly asked or even when directly asked, they need to have time to process their thoughts and what they want to say. So I could be sitting there for, you know, 30, 40, 60 seconds, but they're going to say something, give them time. Um, and I think there's a line sometimes people may cross when they're trying to help or um, because they are not comfortable with silence. And silence isn't necessarily bad. You know, other people process things differently. Um, other people speak um, with a different timing and um, they play games with different timing and that it just because they don't play it with the same timing that you do that doesn't mean that they're doing it wrong and that doesn't mean that they're not enjoying it or processing it to the depths that you are so I think that whenever you sit down to play a game uh, before you help first assess if that's even something that they need you know Wait, if you think that somebody isn't taking their turn because they don't realize it's their turn, still give it some seconds to see. And if that's something that, that they've established that sometimes they need to be reminded when it's their turn, do that. But there are players who, you know, have analysis paralysis and there are players who can't just only concentrate on the game and maybe they want to talk and, and also play the game and enjoy both of those together. And you have to... Be mindful of the person who's playing because they are not just an AI who's there to play the game for you, with you. They are enjoying the game in their own separate way. And um, it's very crucial to encourage new gamers and um, to just encourage more people to sit down at a table with you if you recognize that and if you encourage that. All right. Thanks. Hi friends, my name is Amy, and I'm the Board Game Duchess. The Board Game who? I know, I know. You might have seen me around as Duchess 1105, though. But the Board Game Duchess, well, 
<laughs> She's working on existing. A few weeks ago, Anne-Marie from the Girls Game Show asked me to record a, a little segment for Bits and Bobs. <laughs> Three things went through my head. One was, wow, I can't believe she would ask me. That's really cool. Two was, what the hell was I thinking? What am I going to put on camera? And number three was, hey, you know, you've been talking about putting together a channel for well over a year now. Maybe this is the opportunity you need to really get going on that. All right, sounds good. So I did. I ordered my brand new throne room. I ordered a couple of tiaras because what's a duchess without a tiara, right? And uh, made some plans, learned some things, you know, got ready for it. And then life happened. Balance is something that I strive in vain to achieve in my life. It often doesn't happen. What does balance have to do with board games, you ask? Well, for me, taking the time to play a board game is what keeps me balanced. It's the time that I take for myself. I'm so busy that I rarely sit still. And when I do, I'm thinking about a lot of other things. But when I play board games, I can just sit there and enjoy the game and enjoy the people that I'm playing with and focus on my strategy and let some of the craziness of the world kind of melt away for me. So my question to you is, what do you do to strive for balance? How do you maintain it? I think women in general really put a lot of pressure on themselves to like be Wonder Woman and just do it all. You know, the clean house, the perfect kids, the perfect dinner, all that kind of fun stuff. I know that I'm my worst enemy for sure. I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to do it all and I really can't. But lately, I haven't even been taking any amount of time for myself. Usually, I used to try to, you know, dial into my international game family, which is Lusa Palooza, but I haven't even been doing that lately. By the end of the last couple of weeks, I wasn't in a very good place. I was pretty depressed, actually. And some things didn't go very well in the last couple of weeks. And, you know, just put me further down that dark hole. And if I had taken some time for myself, even just a couple hours a day, even an hour a day, you know, then maybe I would have been able to handle those challenges and struggles a little bit better. And or at least have a little bit better outlook on the outcome. But I was just too busy. So how do you try to strive for balance? What do you do? I'm definitely curious because I, I'm not good at it. I'm really not good at it, but I would like to get better and I would love your help. So back to the board game Duchess. Yeah, she doesn't exist yet. But I do have a YouTube channel. You could subscribe if you'd like. I promise there will eventually be something there. It may not be anything you want to watch, but you know, I try. <laughs> so, well, I think that's it for me. But here's to the board game Duchess, who will hopefully eventually um, be bringing you fun and creative ways to bling out your board games and make them a royal experience without spending the royal price. But in the meantime, have fun gaming. Hi everyone, I'm the Cardboard Kid. Solo games are a great thing to have, especially now because of COVID-19. Usually you could invite people over, but now it's just down to you and your family. What about if your family can't play with you? Make the best of a bad situation by checking out the solo rules for some of those games on your shelf. Some games have a bot to play against. The coin war game series have really good ones. You use a flow chart. If this is true, then do that. Keep going down to resolve, then repeat for the other factions. Actually, a lot of war games can be played solo. Other games have a system in place, like a dice roll, card flip, or chip pull that you resolve to act as if someone else was there. Street Masters and other games by Adam and Brady Sadler are good at this. In my last Bits and Bobs, I talked about print and plays. Going back to that, loads of those have solo modes. Roll and rights, or flip and rights, or whatever and rights, often can be played solo. Check out Welcome to Cartographers, and one I mentioned last time, Star Maps. While the majority of games are designed for multiple players, some are designed for solo play only, or at least have specific rules for a single player. 
Lexaterna has you racing to repair your spaceship before it gets sucked into a black hole. Hero Weehawken has you trying to bring the treasonous Aaron Bird to justice before he betrays the U.S. further. Black Sonata has you looking for the mysterious dark lady that Shakespeare wrote about. I also mentioned sports simulations last time. With the sports season shortened or even cancelled, see what could have been and or relive past years by yourself or with a friend. Because you're rolling dice, then comparing the results to a result book, you're in it more for the stories that sports can tell rather than the strategy. My dad created a massive wrestling federation in Face to the Mat, designing custom cards and everything. Graphic novel adventures are a brilliant invention and, in my opinion, some of the best solo games available. Their comic book choose your own adventures. A few have you solving mysteries at Sherlock Holmes, one has you settling a town in the Wild West, and there's even a superhero one. Season 3 shipping soon, but there are already 11 of them, plus two multiplayer co-op ones. While solo games can't provide the social parts of gaming, they can deliver stories and strategies and thematic gameplay just like multiplayer ones. Just because you're by yourself, you don't have to stop enjoying games. Hi everyone, it's Michelle Ridge here. I'm going to be talking about losing control in board games. Euro games have this way of rewarding control and enjoying planning, whether that's growing a civilization or building an engine. Euro games have this way of rewarding you if you know exactly what to do, have the right timing, and effectively just get all of your stuff done. But some of life's moments that come as a surprise and are not planned at all in other words, out of your control, those can have a positive impact on you and can actually contribute to a really great story. I like being able to combine the two in games that I play, which is one of the reasons why Lorenzo Il Magnifico and now Rap Gods are two of my absolute favorite games ever because they incorporate the two. In Lorenzo, it's a die roll, so those die rolls will impact the power of your workers and impact the decisions you have to make. And in Rap Gods, you have beef, where your opponents can just say, well, this is happening now and we're going to have to roll to see what, who wins this thing. And one of us is going to lose and one of us is going to win something. And the rest of both of these games are relatively in your control. You make choices, you get to choose what direction you take, what you need, and try to actually get what you need. Rap Gods is actually responsible for uh, one of the most public examples of me being, as Anna Maria says, stabby for the first time. Most of the other games that uh, I've played on Twitch or just in general haven't really revealed me as someone that can just go for stuff, <laughs> despite the the sort of tabooness of oh no, you've taken this thing from someone. And it's important to recognize that, like in life, things are not actually in your control. You have moment to moment, and you have a plan. You can maintain the 
most detailed calendar and you can get to that day and, and it just doesn't work out. You're not, you're too tired or uh, something happens or your computer breaks and all of that is kind of like, like life's take that. If you have that in games too much, sort of like in life, uh, it's not fun anymore. Uh, you have this sort of sense of futility that none of your plans will even work out and I've experienced that in some games that have too much take that, too much luck. If the game doesn't allow you to navigate those surprises very well, then it's just miserable, especially if the game end is variable or depends on how the table is actually playing together, then that's just hours and hours of absolute futility. You just need the right amount of it. I used to avoid games with the take that element, like no tomorrow. If, if I looked at the rules and it said that, oh, if someone does this to you, then you lose this thing, I would immediately say, no, this is not the game for me. I absolutely just hated Take That. It's heartbreaking to see an engine break or a civilization burn down and you can't do anything about it. But you do want a challenge and surprises have challenges. Uh, some Take That elements in games give you a challenge. If someone has just figured out how to break a game, some of the Take That elements are very important to, to do like to catch up or to slow someone down. And as long as they can get out of it, then it is still fun. Then it is a challenge that you're willing to have in the game. And, you know, we, after all, are playing these games to have fun. And fun doesn't always need to mean multiplayer solitaire. Ask me this, like, pre-rap gods, and I would tell you that I would never that that's not me. Those aren't my words. That's like a clone uh, and like a, like a, a weirdo clone. <laughs> but now I, I kind of get it. You get a great story out of it. I mean, I don't think Anna Maria is, or anyone else who watched that Rap Gods playthrough on Twitch is ever going to forget the kidney stabbing. Like, anytime I see that card when I play my copy of that game, I'm going to remember that moment. And that doesn't happen in multiplayer solitaire. You don't get stories like that without take of that. No one's going to sit down and, and say, oh, how amazing their engine is and have everyone laugh or find joy in that. It'll be more of uh, admiration or pride or those sorts of feelings. So being able to share in overcoming things is really important in the time that we're in right now too. Being able to find glimmers of hope amidst all that struggle, and especially in a game, seeing, okay, there's a way around this. Without having this happen, I wouldn't have had to think about it. And now there's a new puzzle of, okay, the main puzzle where things are totally fine, and then also the puzzle of, well, here's this take that thing that just happened. Let me figure out how to mitigate what just happened and then get back to what my original plan was. Even better if you can integrate that into the game like Rap Gods does. Uh, it's, you get stories and we need to appreciate those stories more.